Oh, welcome back, everyone. Okay, as I promised, so I didn't have these slides with me last class, I wanted to look at uh, multifrontal, multi-threaded, rank-revealing sparse QR. That's a mouthful. Um, this is a very timely project. Uh, this is something I just did a couple of years ago for, at the, actually at the request of the MathWorks. They needed a better QR factorization. So they first looked at the one in the book and said, what do you think? Can we put this in the MATLAB? And I said, nah. <laughs> Mainly because of that, well, for two reasons. One, it's not extremely fast. Uh, two, it has um, that odd problem that if for structurally rank deficient matrices, it pads the matrix. Okay, that's fine if you want to solve a linear uh, a least squares problem and, and get a get a, a, a QR factorization for an approximate solution or a consistent solution to a, to a rank deficient least squares problem, but uh, it doesn't really, it, it, it's, it would cause rather a lot of consternation to typical MATLAB users. And it didn't handle complex matrices and so forth. So, okay, I said, let me write you one of these. Uh, this, this had been, parts of this work had been done before um, but not to the spec that the MathWorks wanted and also wanted to try some new theory uh, in it as well. And so there's some, some a bit of new theory in here and there's certainly new implementation. And so what I want to show you here is not the details but the gist of this. This is a talk, by the way, I gave at Florida State University about a year ago. Um, so I've already talked to you about relationship to sparse Cholesky. And I've already showed you what happens with householder reflections are applied to a sparse matrix. But this is new right here. How do you use those dense frontal matrices? Those will come up very naturally here. When you're doing the QR on this matrix, when you hit this first column with a householder, it replaces every row that takes part in that computation with a set union of all the rows that took part in that computation. So that's a nice little dense submatrix. So let's stick that in a, mat in a dense matrix and operate on it. Okay, and hopefully there's not just one column. What if you've got, you know, like in what was it, project three or four, where you're looking at, you know, columns with identical non-zero pattern, right? Well, that happens a lot. So this this could just be more than one column here. This could be more than just one column. I mean. In which case, you can do a whole QR factorization there. And in fact, as I mentioned, you can keep going. You don't have to just stop here and zero this out and leave that as is. Um, what happens if you do that is that then the subsequent householder vectors can be quite long because this is a dense, this is a dense matrix. So why not just keep going? It's it's certainly feasible to apply a householder operation to a submatrix. Okay, I can, for example, take a matrix A11, A12, A21, A22. And let's suppose I just wanted to, to zero out just this, and I want to leave everything else alone. I just want to zero out the first, I mean, in other words, I leave this stuff there. Well, that's fine. That can be done with this. Okay, we can create a householder operation that only attacks this, sorry, that's a very male term, right? Attacking a matrix. What can I say? So we can we can anni annihilate, oh my gosh, all these terms of war and annihilation, Gaussian elimination, right? The eliminator, I'll be back. <laughs> oh my goodness. So um, H is applied, there we go, <laughs> to this matrix and, and annihil oh, eliminates, no, <laughs> I can't do it. Zeroes out. Zeroes out. Yeah, that just sounds so wimpy. It annihilates these entries and it leaves those alone. Of course, it operates on the entire upper matrix, but that's not a problem if we partition this matrix and this is a zero, each time zero is zero, so nothing happens. So there's nothing wrong with applying a householder to uh, a piece of a matrix and then it can actually uh, improve 
the total number of non-zeros it takes to, to store these factors. So lots of ways of doing QR. Uh, I already explained this is uh, the ha-ha matrix here, okay? You can, anyway, uh, you can choose, as I mentioned here, you can just pick and choose any set of rows here to, an, to annihilate and embed a householder in an identity matrix and then annihilate just part of a, of a matrix. Uh, let's see, um, I already explained this. This is sort of to recap, if QR equals A, then A transpose A is R transpose R, so R is the Cholesky of A transpose A. Row, row orderings have no effect on R. I mentioned this, but it didn't show this formula. If I have a matrix A and I do a per row permutation P on it, so I got the pa pa matrix here, pa transpose pa, okay, this becomes A transpose P transpose P A. Well, P transpose P is just identity. So you just get A transpose A. So row orderings on R have no effect. Column orderings do have an effect. So this is this is why we can do this like this leftmost thing. We can we can rearrange the rows any way we like. We can pick a row, stick it there, and it doesn't have any effect on the fill-in. And that was I used that in the QR factorization in the book to put a row on the diagonal that has a non-zero in it, uh, just so that the theories are nice and tight and the non-zero counts all work out. So um, here's an example. Okay, so suppose we take this first row here, and um, we're going to annihilate these entries. But when that happens, these get annihilated. But as I mentioned earlier, see the non-zero pattern of all three rows then becomes equal. And then we can just repeat this process. Um, and if if we sort the rows according to leftmost non-zero, we're, we're left with a kind of revealing structure here. And we see chunks of rows that if I annihilate groups of these rows together, then what happens, I mean, imagine if I just sit here and annihilate these three entries. What's left is a dense matrix. Well, not dense in it. Well, in this case, it's dense. If I annihilate, so I take these two rows and apply a householder just to these two rows. Okay, what's left is this is a chunk of zeros here, and then these are, and so is this. Actually, that stays zero. That's non-zero, or that's zero, and that's, the dots are the entries that will become eventually non-zero, but they aren't right now. So I can, I can operate on these independently and chew away at them like this. So, you know, say, say you do this. Say you do annihilate the first group. Well, keep going. Why not do more? Okay. And I like this entry as well. And now resort the rows according to the leftmost non-zero. Of course, that's done implicitly. So take that matrix on the right and resort it, and you get this. And now you have another group of rows in the second column. Just repeat this process. You get that on the on the right. And you just repeat here, and you get this big chunk which gets annihilated to zero. And now you've got a chunk here and a chunk down there. And we just keep going. OK, and finally it's all done. Well, the key observation here, as I, meant, as I drew on the board here and also I've got here, is this, that I can take these three rows and put them in a little dense matrix. Just keep track of what columns I'm using. All right, so it's, it's like the sparse matrix data structure you're used to, except rather than just having a single column and some non-zeros, or say a single row and some non-zeros, I've got both rows and columns. It's a block. Or I've got row indices here and column indices there, but the row indices don't matter because the permutation to the rows doesn't matter. So I've thrown away the row indices because I don't care what they are. Any row is just as good as any other. So... Um, that gives us this multi-frontal multi QR factorization. You group these rows of A's, rows of A with non-zeros in the same leftmost column, and apply householder reductions to annihilate them until you get these upper trapezoidal matrices. And this can be viewed in a, in a tree structure. So each of these blocks comes from a different frontal matrix. Each of these each of these are rows of R that are left over when I do a QR factorization here. For example, take this block of six 
rows. If I annihilate this and put a divot of zeros in here, actually it would go, those would be, these entries would be zero, those would be zero, and then over here, those three entries would be set to zero, and then those two, wait, and then that one would be annihilated to zero. In the process, what, you've, what you're left with when you annihilate these is you've got two columns where the matrix is an upper triangular. There's, it's all zero down here. So if you have two columns in this block, that gives you two rows of R. If you've got one column, that gives you one row of R. And here there's, th here there's three. There's three columns that can be annihilated to get an upper triangular part and then a divot. And that gives you the three here. This is the tree of A transpose A, the elimination tree of A transpose A, and it describes the data dependencies between these blocks. This is the block that's down here, and they can be lumped together because it's the same pattern of work. Three and four are separate. Five, six, and seven are all lumped together, and then eight, nine through 12 is all lumped together. And then that gives you, um, well, row f the, the, the front one I already showed you, Okay, and a non-leaf matrix looks like this. We do little bitty QR factorizations, little bitty dense QRs. Okay, so row, the child one I showed you in the previous slide. We, we had here uh, these original rows of A. We just do an independent QR factorization. We get this matrix where R is a, an entry in the upper triangular factor. H is an entry in the householder vector. And C... So, and we just keep going. We annihilate all the way down to the bottom. And then C is, is a set of, C for contribution block, it's a set of rows <clears throat> sort of like artificially generated. They're really, I guess, rows three, four, and five. It doesn't matter what rows they are. But they're rows that are left over. They're not part of R yet. They're still in the A matrix. They have yet to be factorized completely. Because there's other non-zeros down here they have to be operated on with. This is not a row of R because there's other non-zeros down here that have to be annihilated first. So we're going to have to do more work on those six entries in those three rows. The householder vectors, on the other hand, if I want to keep them to save what Q is, I have to shuffle them aside somewhere. Otherwise, I can just throw them away because you can do a QR factorization and discard Q as you go. And that's often um, suitable for a lot of problems, especially solving just a one-off least squares problem. You're trying to, you've got A, you've got B, you want to solve a least squares problem, you don't care what the QR factorization is, you just want the answer. In other words, backslash in MATLAB, okay? You can, as you're computing, you can apply the Q to the right-hand side as you go. And when you're done, you don't need Q. You've already applied it. So this could, could be just thrown away when you're done with this householder factorization, which I have an option in my code for doing that, depending on whether you want to keep it or throw it away. And then these two are the rows of R. So what happens in this little piece right here, we've got more work yet to do with it. And note the place it exists, columns 6, 8, and 11. Okay, that's the next slide, where this block here, there's the 6, 8, and 11. This is the child front one right here. But there's other children of this node here. So there's three children, and I've got to, and there's also some original rows of A, and I've got to concatenate them all together and do a QR factorization for this block. So here's the rows of A for that front. So here's all the pieces that I've got to do a, I've got to glue together to do a QR factorization for columns five, six, and seven, because I've got a column five and a seven, a six and a six and a seven. Columns five, six, and seven now, I want to annihilate to upper triangular. And this is, this is the rows of the matrix now, the original matrix and the, and the modified matrix that contribute to this work. And these sets, by the way, now are disjoint. See, these rows are all disjoint, remember? When we looked at the, the symbolic analysis, all these rows, when a row takes part in a, in a householder, it's disjoint from any other householders that are flying around. So all of these householders, I mean, all, the, all, these, all these sets here are disjoint from each other. Uh, not that it really matters much. Uh, well, it does. It makes uh, life a lot simpler. In fact, we don't need to actually keep track of what these row indices are. Um, 
But it's really useful because it says that, look, I've got, this is a row of my matrix. It's been modified. But it's the whole row. There's nothing left. I mean, I don't have to say, well, oh, but there's more stuff out here. And somehow glue them together or add them together sideways. No, they just need to be all just stacked on top of each other. There's no numerical work here just to rearrange it so it kind of interleaves all these rows together. You've, they have to be spread out a little bit. Like, for example, this is 6, 8, and 11. It's got to be spread out. It's going to have to go corresponding with these columns. You've got to match the columns up. So in some cases, you've got to splay apart, split apart uh, these pieces. So when all these pieces are put together, that's the result. So where's the C1? The C1 is that little 3 by 3 in columns 6, 8, and 11. And it's here, and it's down there, and it's here. And I've also sorted the matrix according to the leftmost non-zero. And that's useful for several reasons. Uh, the first being that um, I can exploit these chunks of zeros down here. And the householders are much shorter. I only have to do work down to here. So there's less work to do as a result. And so here's the factorized front. Looks like that. And then again, this contribution block goes to the parent. So the, 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 the key feature of this algorithm is, is that all the work is done right here. You see, all the work is done in a dense matrix. So all you got to be able to do is a dense QR. In fact, this dense QR doesn't even have to know or care that it's a frontal matrix of a sparse matrix. In fact, the dense QR just has to go zoop all the way down to the diagonal. I mean, just, it looks like a plain old dense QR. Just here's an here's an A matrix. Here's a matrix A. You know, do a QR factorization of it. Get an upper triangular factor R. The dense QR doesn't know or care that those are stuff you've got to do something else to later on. It's the same piece of work. So it's just a vanilla dense QR, except that if you write it carefully, you can exploit the, the structure down below here and do less work. You don't have to do this work down here because it's already zero. Um, and I do exploit in the code some of those zeros, but not all of them. Um, I haven't explained this, but it, there is a way, and it, and it speeds things up a bit. Uh, it can speed things up substantially to apply householders not as column by column, but to group them together and do what's called a block householder. So for example, these two columns can be grouped together and they can be applied all at the same time to the rest of the matrix. And if that happens, well then you can't really exploit these zeros, but you can exploit these down here below the block. And similarly, these, but not those. So you just sort of fill in this chunk here with mortar, right? You just sort of slap in some cement, fill this in. If I had a pen, pen, I could draw on the board, but then the, the guys in the back room wouldn't like that. Uh, and uh, this algorithm can also uh, nicely handle rank deficient problems because what happens is when you do the QR factorization and things go well, you go from this to this. When things don't go well, if you come across a zero here, like you do a, you do a QR, suppose this is matri matrix is rank deficient, and you find that, oops, hey, this, this column is a, is a replica of the first column. Well, your R will look, will look like this, and you, 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 you allow that to be a hard zero. But and then what happens is the next step, you don't just do the QR factorization down the diagonal, and you just put a zero there and a non-zero here. You shift the QR over so that the next step, you treat that as zero, and you treat this as, as column two, if you will. That is, you say, well, look, I didn't have any success here. Let me try this this one. So the columns aren't reordered. Um, instead, when, when, when you do the QR factorization of the first column, and you come to the second one, you find that these two entries have also been zeroed out. Oops. They're zero. Since, since this is a column that's linearly dependent on the columns before it, so if these are zero or close enough to zero to call them zero, 
And there's a numerical threshold test there that does that. If the norm of this vector that's left here to be annihilated is small enough, then we just treat it as zero. And so without any work, annihilating this one also annihilates the second one. So then this is just basically ignored. So let's ignore that. You see, and there's an upper triangular three by three matrix. And so that's how the QR factorization proceeds. It says, oh, well, I already annihilated this one. Let me use this one as my second column in my QR and annihilate everything below it. And I can do that uh, because this thing is already zero. So this is what's called the squeezed R. Uh, Mike Heath did this for uh, a sparse QR with Gibbons rotations. And I extended the work to, or, to do it for a frontal uh, matrix method uh, when I wrote the, this multifrontal sparse QR. Because MATLAB needed, MATLAB was using, the MathWorks was using Heath's method and they were using this squeezed R idea. So what happens when you do a QR factorization of a rank deficient matrix in MATLAB, this is the R you can get. It's not upper triangular, which is kind of ugly, actually. Uh, when you do a back solve on this, it has to do yet another QR factorization, which is not so bad. But um, another alternative, if you want a basic solution, it's called, is you basically ignore this and you say that, look, the unknown corresponding to this column, well, I'll just set to zero. I have a rank deficient problem. It's not, you know, it's not uh, rank three. It's, well, what would the rank be? I guess the rank would be three. Um, Anyway, uh, this this might be this might not be a rank deficient problem if I've but it it's got a column that that's linearly dependent on the other ones. This the second column is linearly dependent on the other ones. Now it would have been possible to swap this column out to the back. Okay, that's another strategy. This this matrix might in fact be full rank, it's just that the second column is linearly dependent on the first. Okay, um, but and so dense QR, you can do what's called a QR factorization with column pivoting. If you come across a column that's too small, you just move it to the back and you pull the next one in and you just shuffle the columns around. Well, that's all fine and well and good for a dense matrix. But you see the fill reducing ordering, all the symbolic analysis, all the work we did to figure out how oh, it's a non-zero pattern of R and how many non-zeros and what's the structure of computation, what's the elimination tree, what's everything symbolically depends on the column ordering. So we can't just willy-nilly, willy-nilly, have you heard that word before? That means just arbitrarily. We cannot just arbitrarily shuffle the columns around. We've got to leave them in place, otherwise their symbolic analysis is, has to be thrown away. And that's awkward, because if I throw that away, what do I do? Recompute it? Okay, fine, I'll recompute it. I'll, I'll move columns and I'll recompute it. And then what happens on the next step? <laughs> the next column is bad. Oops, recompute it? I mean, that's just is ridiculous. So um, you can't, we can't shuffle the columns around. So that's what the squeezed R looks like. But what can happen, and this is what I do in MATLAB, if, if you ask for a QR factorization in MATLAB and you permit me to permute the columns. So in MATLAB, you can ask, you can do this in MATLAB. QR equals QR of A. Now, if A is rank deficient and sparse, R might be this odd, bizarre, squeezed matrix over here. Because there's, I can't, I haven't, there's no way for me to tell you what the column permutation is here. So I've got to do QR time, Q times R equals A, and that's the, the R. There's no other way around it. You, you, I have no freedom to permute the columns at all. Because I have to return a Q and an R such that Q times R equals A. That's the problem specification. There's no way to permute the columns. But if you put in here a third argument, then you get this, and I, and I apologize for the, uh, <laughs> there's no pun intended by, by this. <laughs> okay, uh, it's just the way the letters work out. <laughs> Kind of crude, sorry. Um, maybe I should call this something else. There. Permutation matrix S. That's better now. Oh, now I'm now I'm being less crass. 
Okay, so <laughs> so here's the algorithm outline then. Uh, well, this is a, a simple pre-processing step. Um, it can happen that, um, this is kind of a neat little trick. It's very helpful though. Suppose you've got a matrix A and you've got a, a column with a single non-zero in it. Just one non-zero. Ah. Well, I can if you have if you give me the freedom to permute the columns, uh, and the row permutation can be done can be folded into Q. By the way, if I have another permutation P on the front here, I can ignore that and just fold it into Q and get Q prime, and give you the Q with that's been permuted. You don't know or care. So row permutations are not a problem. But if you permit me to permute the columns, I can say ah, put this up to the top, and now this is all zero. And now I've got a matrix. This might be, this might have lots of entries in it. The first row. Uh, and now repeat. If I now have in this submatrix a, 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 a column that's all zero except for one entry, then it could be permuted up here as well. And basically, what it's doing is it's finding a permutation to upper triangular form. You did this in one of your something like this anyway. In, in, the, in your permuted triangular solve problem. Here I'm actually permuting the matrix. And the idea is, is if you have a column with a single entry in it, then that's the one to choose. And stick it on the diagonal. And so you get an upper triangular matrix that way. And then at some point you may, you may finish all the way down and you're done. That's the QR. It's just a permutation. Boom. It's finished. So if you ask me in MATLAB to factor, do a QR factorization, of a morally or psychologically triangular matrix. If you remember that term that I that Cleve Muller and John Gilbert invented, psychologically triangular matrix. A matrix is the permutation of a triangular matrix. If you give me such matrix, I will find you the permutation, and the Q will just be a permutation matrix. That's the QR factorization. Uh, orthogonal matrix times an upper triangular, it works, right? No numerical work to do at all. Just some permutations. So that's very handy. Very nice special case because these matrices happen. And also very often happens that there's a lot of those uh, singletons. So pruning them away is very fast. And uh, the fill reducing ordering happens next. That's chapter seven. Haven't looked at that. Symbolic analysis, we've, we've, I've shown you this already. Find the, sort the rows, find the leftmost, do the task. If, now that we have the tree, we have this, these, we can lump together. Um, that next thing is to lump together similar nodes to get super nodes, just like, not unlike project four, I guess it was. That's the, tr the supernodal solve that you did. And then this task tree can be, this tree now can be split apart for parallelism, right? Because the tree describes the data dependencies. And so separate subtrees are completely independent tasks. So there's parallelism to be exploited there, and I do that. And then the numerical factorization has several things. There's the frontal matrix assembly. You've got to glue those fronts together. And then factor the dense fronts, and then stack the contribution block later on for the parent. Uh, singletons already explained how to do that. What happens to Q? Um, I'll skip this. And here's some performance results. Uh, this is on a matrix that's 2 million by 110,000. It's in my sparse matrix collection. And before uh, any of my work, backslash in MATLAB uses an implementation of sparse QR uh, that the performance is, I don't, I, I'm not sure, it's sometimes comparable to the code in the book, sometimes slower. So I'm not sure how my code in the book would, would attack this problem. It'd be interesting to, to try it. But anyway, backslash in MATLAB, unmodified on this matrix, it never finished. I gave up. It, it ran for two weeks. So I just, it just died. So I told, you can tell backslash, there's a way of telling backslash not to do any fill reducing ordering. Okay, so don't do any permutations to reduce the fill. And so I pre-permuted the matrix 
using uh, call AMD or minimum degree algorithm. That's in chapter seven of my own. And then I could get backslash to work. Backslash took 11 days for this problem. Huge. Uh, a comparable multifrontal QR took three and a half hours. This is not my code. This is somebody else's code. My sequential algorithm of the same method, same ordering, cut the time in less than half. If I use a better ordering method, a nested dissection, graph partitioning based ordering, it cuts the time by another factor of two. And then if I use parallelism with 16 processors, I cut the, fa uh, the work by a factor of about six on 16 processors. So I get the time down to seven minutes from infinite or 11 days. You can actually do this in the old MATLAB because you can tell the MATLAB backslash not to reorder the matrix you can give it a re do your own reordering, then call backslash, and it takes 11 days. That's ridiculous. And then we can now do it in seven minutes, which is a factor of like 2,000 speed up. It's huge. And this this resulting QR factorization is getting 14 gigaflops on a 70 gigaflop machine in parallel. On a single core, it's getting two and a half gigaflops, which is the same as the dense QR. All of that, and this counts all the symbolic work, all this E tree stuff, and you know we worried so much about, well, you know, let's make this asymptotically efficient. Well, it pays off. Okay, it pays off substantially because then all that symbolic work is is just the time is essentially evaporates. There's no time at all compared to the numerical work. So, all the work is done in the numerical factorization. Really, the symbolic time is is negligible. So this two and a half gigaflop peak, then the, the, t the t time used to compute that rate includes the symbolic analysis. So the entire QR factorization from start to finish takes X amount of time, and it does X amount of work, and it does work at that rate, the total work. And the dense QR in MATLAB is just as fast. That's rather astonishing that you can do a sparse factorization or a dense factorization at the same performance. And the reason is because of this multifrontal notion where you say, look, I'm not going to do gather, scatter, and all that jazz, all those symbolic, and all, all that, all that you know, moving data around in disparate places in memory during the numerical factorization. That's what the book does, right? Because it's simple and it's asymptotically efficient. But if you recast it into these dense blocks, then this is very cache friendly. And it's just loaded into cache, the dense QR just slices it in half and spits it back out again, and we're done. It's very fast. We run, then this can be factorized at, at performance at or close to the theoretical peak of the machine, of the CPU. Whereas when you're grabbing words in random places from memory with gather scatter, you're working at the memory bus speed. And it's, it's irregular at that. It's grabbing here, it's grabbing there for the gather scatter. Gather scatter is very inefficient uh, in terms of memory traffic. I mean, it can be 100 times slower, right? Because think about the memory bus speed. The memory bus speed is maybe 10 times slower than the CPU, but that's grabbing sequential blocks of memory, right? Prefetching block after block into cache. Still, even doing that, it's 10 times slower than the CPU. Okay, but if you then ask memory to, to behave irregularly, truly random access memory. And it's 100 times slower than the CPU. And so this is 100 times faster as a result. So it's a big difference. You know, a factor of 100 is really useful. Really, it, you know, it opens up. You can solve problems you couldn't solve before. Who wants to wait 11 days? This, this matrix came from, I, I think this, if I recall, this matrix came from the European Space Operations Center, and they're tracking, they're trying to use measurements to track uh, satellite, part, uh, junk satellites and junk in space. So you've got measurements, you want to find out all their orbits of all these thousands of bits of junk in space. So you've got all these measurements, and you're trying to sort them all out. Well, to do that, you need to solve a big least squares problem because you have more observations than, co than coefficients that describe the orbit. And you have to, because otherwise, to get an accurate result. 
So you need a big overdetermined system. It's 2 million by 110,000 for all these particles up and junk up in space. It's kind of funny. We're doing all this fancy th work to analyze junk. Garbage removal. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, you know, would you rather spend 11 days solving the problem or seven minutes? And you've got more than one matrix to operate on. So it just is, becomes, it was un, infeasible before. So that's kind of cool. Um, that, and, and this is, as I said, a lot of this is not new stuff. I mean, you know, these other codes are out, out there as well that can do this stuff. I just added some features and made it a little bit more efficient, made, you know, did some parallelism in it and got some, uh, work, had dealt with these column singletons and structural and numeric rank deficiency, which had not been done before in the QR. Multifrontal QR, anyway. So, and this is really cool. This is um, a performance comparison. Every circle, you know, I've got all these matrices, right, in the collection. Every circle is a matrix in my collection. And the denominator here is a symbolic analysis. It comes from the symbolic analysis. When you do the symbolic analysis, you can find lots of things. You can find the flop count. How much work is it going to take to factor the matrix? You can find out how much memory it's going to take to solve the problem as well. So the, the, this, you can't see it on the very bottom of the TV screen, but this, is the, this x axis is flop count divided by memory usage. So it's the flops per memory, thank you, flops per memory traffic, if you will. And that's a placeholder for how much potential there is for cash reuse. If the ratio is 10, that, you, that means that you do roughly, for every word of memory you bring in, you do 10 flops. If it's 100, for every word of memory you bring in, you do 100 flops. So that would be here. And this ratio is an amazing predictor of performance. I mean, it's possible for matrices to be off of this curve, way down here or up here. But look where most of them are. Look how predictive this, this that's, that's how predictive this ratio is. It's typically very predictive, even when it's possible to be off the curve, way off the curve for any given matrix. So this is not an artifact just based on, oh, well, every possible matrix you could imagine with any possible method would be in a straight line. Because, you know, when you do a log log, this is a log log plot. When you do a log log plots, you tend to get straight lines. Okay. And, and you get things clustered together, but you don't here necessarily. There's outliers, which says that it's possible, even though it's theoretically possible for matrices to be anywhere on this plot, they're along that smooth curve. So the outliers actually, the exceptions actually prove the rule here that this is a very powerful predictor of performance. And here's, on a single core, here's the gigaflops. The dots are the dense QR. Of course, it starts off very fast, but then it peaks, it, it levels out. And at this point here, for these very, very large matrices, this is where it actually matches or even exceeds the, the dense QR performance. There's some kind of little odd cache effect here. There's a, there's a blip, I'm not sure what's going on there. But this is just a square dense QR factorization, I think. It goes zoop, at 1,000, and then it goes back down just a little bit and smooths out. I'm not sure why. Cash, as I said, cash effects. So, so anyway, that is multifrontal QR. So this gives you a feeling for industrial strength uh, software. It's, but it's all the theory. I, I didn't put m much of the discussion of this in the book because the book was meant to be, you know, thin, thin and, and, and not thin, but the, the book is, is, is meant to be a, a, a basic introduction to the theory. And multifrontal methods rely upon the theory in the book, but they go beyond it a little bit. There's not a lot more theory in multifrontal methods. But there's a whole lot more implementation. I mean, this code right here took maybe it's 20,000 lines of code. The dense QR in the book, I can almost fit it on a couple pages. 
right? But it's 10 to 100 times slower than the one I just showed you. Plus the symbolic analysis, okay, maybe it's a couple hundred lines of code. You know, compare that with 20,000. I couldn't print 20,000 lines of code in the book, and I certainly couldn't talk about them all. Right? There's just too much details there. There's a lot of details in the implementation about how you pack these fronts together and, um, and such. But the ratio, if you will, of, of the ratio of theory per line of code then is much smaller in that method, the multifrontal method. Here it's much higher, right? And, the, and there's 2,000 lines of code in the book, 2,200 lines of code, I think. And all this theory, huge amounts of theory. The multifrontal method adds not much more theory, but a whole lot more code. So it becomes harder to see the theory, if you will. So that this, is, this book is focusing on, on theory and asymptotically efficient implementations Thus, they use gather-scatter and not multifrontal methods. So that gives you a picture now of multifrontal methods. So let me, um, and I've got now another 10 minutes left. So let me go back now to LU factorization. And I apologize for being a little bit out of order in terms of the, the talks, but I didn't have or the slides here because I didn't have this up with me when I... Uh, needed to go on ahead. So full screen mode. So here we go then back to LU factorization, chapter six. So let's see how far we got in here. We talked, I showed you this. I think I left off there, didn't I? Yes, I left off here. I left off with the left looking LU factorization. All right. So I have the idea here that, I'm using the idea, I should say, that I've got an inductive algorithm where you, you get the first k minus 1 columns of L computed and the first k minus 1 columns of U computed. And the question is, is can you compute the kth column of L and the kth right here column of U? And if you can do that, and if you can compute the first column of L and U, and that's trivial, I want to actually even show that, then uh, that's the base case. Then by induction, you can do the entire LU factorization. So that's one way of doing LU factorization. So then when you, what we need to do then is this three by three would generate, if we wanted to, nine equations, one for each of these terms. Turns out we don't need all nine, we just need these three. So take these three and write three equations down. So the A12 equation. So this is the, the block entry one, two. So I need to take the first block here and the second one here and multiply them together. So L11 times U12 plus zero equals A12. That's this equation. And then this L21 times u21 plus u22. So there's a 1 here, remember? I'm assuming that the diagonal of L is 1 equals a22. That's this equation. And the last equation is L31u12 plus L32u22 equals a32. So I have three equations here. And um, these three equations can be solved one at a time. I don't have to do them one at a time, as you'll see. Three equations. and so what is this? L11, U12 equals A12. I know the A values, of course, because I have the matrix. L11, I assume I know. So I can solve for U12. That's a lower triangular solve, isn't it? And not only that, it's Oliver Twist. It's a sparse lower triangular solve, where A is the right-hand side is sparse. We have the same, the main character who's finding himself all throughout the whole book, the sparse triangular solve with sparse right-hand side and sparse solution uh, comes back now in LU. Then once I know U12, I can take that, uh, let's see, I know this. So this is a dot product. Now in the up-looking Cholesky, it was a dot product of a row with itself, but this is not. This is two different matrices, two different vectors. L21, the row vector. U12, a column vector. Remember, U22 is a scalar. U12 is a column vector. So we have a row vector times a column vector. That's a dot product. 
plus a scalar, which we don't know, equals a scalar, which we do know. Ah, I can subtract. I can take u22 equals a22 minus the dot product, and I have u22. I have the pivot entry, which I'm not yet doing partial pivoting. Let's, let's ignore that for the moment. That turns out to be easy to do, but it, it complicates the equations quite a lot. It's easy to implement, but the equations get very complicated. And then finally, the last one. Now I know u12 and I know u22, but I don't know with a scalar u22, but I don't know L32, the column of L. And so I can solve this equation for L32. It's the only part of the equation I don't know. So I can solve for that by taking A32, the column vector, subtracting. This is a matrix vector multiply, a sparse matrix times a sparse vector. We know how to do that. Subtract it from a sparse column vector. We know how to do that. Divide by that sparse column by a scalar, u22. I know how to do that, and there we have L. So that gives us an outline of the method. But what's really cool is that I can do almost all three of these equations in a single sparse triangular solve, surprisingly. And that's the magic of this next equation. Okay, you see this equation here. Now let's just look at this. Let's, let's fabricate a matrix that looks like this. We have this at such matrix, right? I have L11, I have L21, I have L31. In other words, this matrix is just the first k minus 1 columns of my L matrix. Not just the first k minus 1 rows and k minus 1 columns, but all the rows. But the first k minus 1 columns. And now let me just augment this with identity. This is a 1 on the diagonal and identity here. Now, that augmentation, I don't actually have to make a data structure that has that in it. Okay, if I have just this part of the matrix, okay, I can I can look at this matrix. I've got k minus one, no value of k, and I can say, oh, now give me the k, you know, give me column 57. What if k is 42? Give me column 57. Oh, that's just the fifth. That's just, and we could just we could just assert what that column ought to be without actually putting it there in a data structure. Okay. So I can take it matrix, if I just have this upper part, or this left part, I can pretend, I can just put the identity there by pretending. I don't actually have to insert it into the data structure. All right, so this matrix is, is, is available to us because we're computing L column at a time. We're, we're taking L and we're just tacking on column after column after column. And so this is just the matrix I have so far, the L matrix I have so far with an implicitly augmented identity matrix to the bottom right. Okay, and then let me put in, so what, you know, what is this going to do for me? Well, let me show you. Let me slap in my A column. This is the kth column of A. So this is the matrix L I have so far. This is the kth column of A. What happens if I solve this thing? Okay, if you solve this thing, look at what happens now, what the solution to this will be. In fact, let's, I, I actually should put this on one, one slide, and I've got 30 seconds to do it, so maybe I won't do it. I can't write it all down. But it'll turn out that U12, U22, and, and L32 can just be immediately derived. These three equations, in other words, are almost completely computed by portions of the x vector here. The, thing, the three things I'm solving for on the previous slide, u12, u22, and l32, are just going to be pieces of this x vector, the answer I get out. So what that means is that I don't actually have to do these three separate computations, a triangular solve, a dot product, a matrix vector multiply. I can just do a single triangular solve. And I'll go through the algebra uh, next class. A single triangular solve and then a divide by the diagonal and I have the kth column of L and U. Bingo. Just like that. So that's, I'll, I'll work through the algebra and then I'll show you all the detail, all the gory details of how to implement the thing. Um, and there are some gory details to worry about. In particular, I haven't talked about partial pivoting. 
and how that has to happen. That's a rather gory detail in the code. Permutations, as you know, in code are very gnarly, right? Now we've got permutations going on, and we have to worry about how do we how we handle those, and they're happening on the fly as well. Uh, so there's some real there's some tricks we have to apply to make this work efficiently. So we'll pick up there. On, I'll show you the algebra for this next class then. Thank you.